This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from OpenTuition.com. When we looked at the income tax computation, uh, we dealt with uh, all sorts of different types of income. So we had uh, in the non-saving section, we had trade profits. And we had employment income. And then in the uh, savings, there were things like bank or building society interest. And then there were dividends, which were dealt with. And all of those rules of how those various sources of income are assessed and taxed is in the first lecture and recording. Um, we have dealt with that one and that one, and we have dealt with all the various chapters with that one, including partnerships. And hopefully you are now doing these in a logical progressive order because they build one on the other. So please watch them in the order in which they are placed in the manual because it would make a lot more sense if you do. So this chapter deals with employment income, income from a salary or a job. Now, the scope of this, again, there are many rules and regulations and legal cases that have built up over the years as to whether somebody is or isn't employed. You may have seen cases in the press about whether somebody is employed by the company or whether they are self-employed. Because obviously all the income um, that comes in would probably be the same regardless, but the expenses that you can claim if you're self-employed are totally different than you can if you're employed. The way it's taxed, i.e. self-assessment or pay-as-you-earn through the um, deduction system that the employer has in place, uh, the national insurance contributions that you pay. The rate for tax is exactly the same and the personal allowance is the same, but the national insurance is different. So people will have argued with the revenue that they are one or the other, whichever suits them. So over a period of time, there have come in some principles and laws followed by legal cases, uh, which thankfully you don't need to know. Um, which have tried to define whether somebody is employed or self-employed because an employee is taxable in, under employment income, which is this chapter, whereas a self-employed person is taxable under trading income rules, which are different, are in different chapters. So these principles of whether somebody is employed or self-employed follow this main test. So, self-employed is the existence of a contract of services compared to a contract of four services for somebody who is uh, self-employed. So, employees have a contract of services. Self-employed have a contract for services. Now, that could be a little multiple choice question. Can you remember the difference between of and for? Okay, I'll leave that one for you. For, um, the only way I can remember, oh, there's an F in both of them. Um, oh, it's difficult to think how better. Of E for Ed. Of E for Ed. I'll leave it with you. We also have a mnemonic. Now, we'd have one of these before. Now, this one's called His Chore to help you remember the the various different tests that the revenue have put into place now these are the revenues so h i s c h o r e so an employee is entitled to benefits normally provided to employees such as sick pay and h holiday pay now, in an exam, you may have to, to discuss these, so make sure that you've, you can learn them. The 
Work performed by an em employee is the integral part, really, really involved in the business, not merely an accessory of it. So a self-employed person um, would come and go, whereas an employee would be really inside the business. Uh, there is an integral part of that business. The employee, yes, the employee is obliged to work personally and exclusively for their employer and cannot hire his own helpers or send a substitute. Yes. So if you got a job and you worked as a chef in a restaurant, um, you couldn't send your sister or your brother to go and do your job for you. Okay. And you work just for them. Um, I know some people have two jobs. That's slightly different. That makes it kind of a little bit more complicated. But basically, when you're there, you're there. You can't send somebody else to do the work for you. Um, normally, the employer will control the manner and method of work. So they will tell you um, when to come. And again, here we've got specific hours. So the manner and method and work and hours, they're kind of mixed in together. So um, you will have, have certain qualifications. You will go, you will work for an accountant. You've passed your ACCA. Well done. Um, and they will say when you come to work, what you've got to do, how you've got to do it. Uh, that's just part of being an employee. And they will, may give you specific hours, fixed times that you need to come in. So do you come in at nine, leave at five, you have lunch at one o'clock? Um, and those are very sp specified. Now, if you were self employed, to a large extent, you could determine when you came, when you left, when you had your lunch. Um, the next one, oh, obligation. An obligation by the employer to offer work. So if you work for somebody, they're obliged to give you something to do. And you are obliged to do it because you've signed a contract to say that you work for them and you're going to do this work on their behalf. Um, so normally you can't say, I'm sorry, I'm not doing that today. OK, that's that's definitely not something that um, would go down well with your employer. So that obligation. Now, the, con the economic reality of self-employed. So risk and reward. If you're an employee, you know what you're going to be paid because you've signed a contract and in it, it will tell you how much you get either per hour, per week, per month or per year. Self-employed people have the right to work where they want, when they want, and how often they want. But there's a risk with that. If they don't work enough, they won't earn enough to be able to pay their bills. Um, but if they work a lot and they work um, and, and pick good contracts, uh, make wise decisions in their business with the funds that are available and the decisions they make as to where they work and how they work and what items of um, resources they have, there is the reward. So risk and reward is the R in this uh, mnemonic. And uh, an employee does not provide his own equipment. You wouldn't go to work for an accountant having passed your exams, well done, again, um, and they expect you to bring your own desk and chair. But if you were a builder and you were going to that accountant's to build a wall, the accountant isn't going to provide the bricks or the cement mixer or the tools, the spades and whatever. As self-employed, you're expected to bring your own equipment. So these are the two um, main things that you need to be aware of. Contract of services for an employee, for services for self-employed, and then this mnemonic. Holiday pay an integral part, substitute control, hours obligation, risk reward, and equipment. Now, in, if in an exam you are expected to um, answer a question about this, it will be a discussion where you need to apply the rule, i.e. one of these, one, two, three, four, five, six, eight, one of these eight, and then to apply it, but you will not have to make a decision because the rules, you will argue one, the revenue will argue another. So you won't have to make a decision. So understand what those eight different rules are, principles, and then apply them to the question that, um, that you are 
given in your exam. Now, what is assessable on an individual who works um, as an employee? All right, this is a technical term, emoluments, and it includes these wages, salaries, bonuses, commissions, and benefits. Now, this part is what makes up most of this chapter. Benefits in kind. Benefits in kind. Wages and salaries, bonuses, commissions, those are the sort of things that you will be um, given. It's your salary, things that you've received while you're entitled to, to be working there. You are, you are uh, able to deduct certain expenses. Now, when we did the uh, looked at the lecture for trade uh, expenses, we only had those two words wholly and exclusively, you'll remember those. This has an extra word, necessary. And that means that most of the expenses that self-employed people can claim, employees can't because it's not necessary. Again, you won't have to decide whether something is necessary or not. So uh, contributions to an approved occupational scheme, they are allowed. Fees and subscriptions to professional bodies. So your ACCA subscriptions, if you're paying those, that's an allowable expense against income, if you're paying them. Um, payroll, charity payroll deductions. Uh, certain travel expenses. Again, you see that word? Necessary in the performance of your duties. So not going to and from work while you're at work if you're sent out to do something and you take your car then you can make a claim for that but you can't claim home to the office um wholly exclusively new okay um capital allowances that is seriously rare um and these have been agreed by hmrc Um, as to what is and what isn't allowed. Now, it mentioned there about travel expenses, the approved mileage scheme. This is in the rates at the front of your uh, exam, front of your textbooks, front of your manuals. Um, don't guess. Always check. That you've got the right figure and it's 45p per mile for the first 10,000 business miles and 25p thereafter it's been that for a long time and as it says there in the in the a part not home to the office that's private expense um, normally what happens in this situation is um, you would fill in an expenses form so say you were in the office and you're going out to do an audit you would fill in an expense form for the miles that you travel from the office to the client and back again. And at the end of the month, you would then submit that and then they would pay you and reimburse you at 45p per mile for the first 10,000 miles. And if you're doing excessive miles, then you get 25 pence thereafter. Okay, now example number one, we're going to have a look at. So this is Kerry, who uses her car. That's, that, that's uh, irrelevant. She drove 12,000 miles for the performance of her duties and they paid her 30 pence per mile. We are to compute the allowable deduction that she can claim. She hasn't been paid sufficient there. You can see that. And if you haven't been paid some, uh, sufficient um, according to these approved mileage schemes, then you can make a claim every year for that to be deducted, um, to be to be uh, deducted, and you can then um, get the the money back from um, HMRC. So example number one, you can make that claim. So the mileage allowance. So this is what she has received. They paid her thirty pence. For those 12,000 business miles that she did. So they paid her £3,600. £3,600, it is tax free. However, she is entitled to more. So what they've done, and this is what you would need to do, this shows you know the rules 
That is the rule. You have shown it. Show your workings, all your calculations. The examiner, this is a model answer. This is what the examiner would have if he was looking at your answer. So the first 10,000 miles at 45p is £4,500. Then the balance of that, the 2,000 miles, is at 25p. So that's what she's entitled to. That's what she's had. And this is what she can claim. Simple as. Okay, and you can do that if you if you if you are underpaid, you can go back six years, and and reclaim that. Now, pro formas. We love a pro forma because this is what the examiner is expecting you to produce. So all the income is added in first. Any salaries any bonuses, um, any benefits that uh, you have received. Um, now this in itself may be a, a pro forma in itself because there may be quite a few of those or it may just be a list that you've done of workings so you have working one, two, three, four, five and that's the total that you've brought to the table any reimbursed expenses and any cash vouchers. So that's your total income. And then any expenses that you can claim, you see there, wholly exclusively, any contributions to the pension scheme, subscriptions and fees, charity donations, travel and subsistence, that's 45p for 10,000 miles. That's a recap and then 25p thereafter. That's the uh, balance and use of your own car. And there you will see a list again of the donations. That's a similar list to the ones at point four.